Hi, and welcome to our section on covering big data. So firstly, let me introduce you to what big data actually is. So what exactly is big data? Well, is it just hype? Because you've been hearing about big data for the last maybe five to 10 years, and it's used mainly by marketers, marketers and sensationalist media. But what exactly is it? It's been such a big buzzword, but few people actually understand this term correctly. So generally, even though a lot of people think big data is AI, big data is not actually AI. AI is basically an output of big data's information, but that allows us to create advanced AI algorithms, but big data is not AI. So what exactly is it and how big is big data? So let's get started. So this is a cool little analytics uh, word map showing all of the associ associated words with big data, but let's get to it. How big is big? Well, let's define big data first. Big data refers to huge volumes of data that cannot be stored or pro and processed in the tr on traditional computers. So it's a huge volume of data. That's what we need, need to know. And it's processed by non-traditional means and the data is huge. Now, how huge are we talking about? Well, big data could be in gigabytes, terabytes, even petabytes, but it isn't always the case. It, it depends on the organization. And sometimes small data can become big because you can have a simple 500 meg file that isn't too big, but keep adding on features and features and adding different columns and categories to it. And suddenly you have a thousand columns and it becomes a big data file. So here are some examples of big data. Think about the user information for millions of customers for any multinational or even national companies. They're, they can be huge. There's like tons of rows. You have like address, information, fields, subscription packages, maybe history packages, and that data exists all over the place in these organizations. Then think about behemoths like Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon, all of these big giants, especially social media giants. They have tons of data. Think about WhatsApp. WhatsApp is probably, probably has a million simultaneous conversations going on right now. All of that is considered big data. And then behavioral data. Remember, your phones are tracking you all the time. Many apps are doing that right now. And I worked with a company that was tracking 100,000 users a day on, on a mobile app. And it ended up being like gigs of data per day, the amount, of, the amount of information that was being stored. So that was definitely a big data task. And image data. Image data can be quite big too. Imagine you have CCTV cameras that are just capturing all of these videos from multiple cameras. All of that is considered big data. And similarly for text, you have like news, news online, newspapers, newspapers and blogs and all of these sites like Medium pushing so many different articles every day. That is basically considered big data too. So let's take a look at the types of big data. There are structured big data, as you can see there are in structured formats like CSV files, Excel or DBF files, which means that they have order to it, but we'll get into that later on. Then there are semi-structured, semi things like in Microsoft Word documents or emails or other documents. And then let's look at unstructured. Unstructured is just totally like images, video, music, um, those type of files would be called unstructured. So let's see what unstructured data is. Now, it's basically like an existing database or existing spreadsheet file or CSV file. It has a nice flat architecture. It has fields, it has columns, it has order. So you can, doing processing on that file isn't too difficult. What about structured or semi-structured? Well, think of a Word document. Think of like you have generally like say, uh, purchase reports, like you have to have justification documents for different purchases in an organization. And imagine you have like tons of these Word documents. They aren't all in the same structure per se. They could have like different paragraphs, different subsections, depending on the type of purchase. So it is semi-structured, yes. However, it could be messy and it's disorganized. And oftentimes you need someone to do some advanced post-processing to organize this data properly. A very good example of this is resume data. Now, that's why almost every company website has this annoyingly long online form forms or fields to fill out for your resume. It's because they want that data to be structured. So when you're comparing it directly to each other, they can see because comparing resumes, resumes have all sorts of different formats. There's no easy way to parse it um, unless you use some sort of AI method. 
and people then tend to like dump a lot of information in their resume that might be irrelevant. And now we go to unstructured, which I mentioned was video, audio, images, that type of data where to do to get order out of this data, you have to do a lot of post-processing that definitely necessitates some advanced algorithms or AI. So look at the basic characteristics of big data. I'm sure you've heard about the three Vs, volume, ver veracity, and velocity. Now first, let's talk about volume. Volume, as I said before, it can be thousands of rows of data or millions of rows of data. Think about a grocery sales. Think about a big grocery train that has like dozens or hundreds of outlets. The amount of transaction data that they have over like an entire day is insane, and that's volume. Now, velocity can be considered something similar. Velocity, imagine you have all these sensors, say in a big city, or even on like a farm, like a digitized um, smart farm. You will have hundreds of sensors sending information, maybe multiple times a second, and that data quickly grows, exp well, not exponentially, but quickly grows to large, large sizes, and that is considered a characteristic of big data, just fast generating data. And variety, now variety isn't always like a necessity for big data, but it's also a characteristic because it just, it just indicates like a bunch of different types of data that can be generated. Because every day right now, you as a person using your mobile phone, using a computer, using online websites, you're generating so much data, so much different data. You have like audio clips, videos you're sending, images, text, text messages, all of those things count as variety. So that's it for that section. Now let's move on to the challenges in big data. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the section on the challenges in big data or faced by big data. So let's take a look at how data is typically generated in an organization, and you can then envision the challenges they face. So imagine we have a fairly big office building. Let's say they're, they're not a tech company, but let's say they're like an accounting firm, uh, um, for example. Now, how is your data generated here? They have tons of customers. They'll have business customers, residential type customers, I mean, non-commercial customers, I should say. And all of those people are just generating tons of data. Then they have, what about the company accounts? They probably have internal data coming in from um, the commercial accounts constantly. Then what about if they have outside sources of data they're, they're, they're passing and bringing in? So you can imagine the, the, a company like this with a few hundred or a thousand employees it has just it's just data and this data is from all over the place and it's constantly coming in. So what they do, they now have to use a data warehouse to keep and store and manage all of that data. Now to do this, businesses, t if they have a good data team, they tend to have a lot of their data being extracted, transformed and loaded into the database. That's an ETL process and it passes through there. However, that it's hard to keep up with all of this. You need a very good data team to manage all of this. I once helped out an airline that actually had tons of data coming in from multiple commercial sources, um, external suppliers, third party operators internally from their teams. And the data was just scattered all over the place. And they eventually had to hire a team that took them six months to a year just to organize everything into a nice database and they had a data warehouse and then they had um, KPI, Power BI charts and K for KPI tracking. It was significantly better than just having the data scattered all over the place. And that's typically happening in many organizations even today. So what are the challenges of dealing with this big data? Well, let's take a look at this. Storage. You will need a lot of storage space and you probably aren't gonna use local storage in your business. You're probably gonna use cloud storage because the amount of data you're generating, especially if you have a data warehouse, you wanna have it somewhere external or in the cloud at least. Secondly, deciding for how long do you keep this data? Do you keep it forever, three months, six months? What's the relevance? So a lot of the data owners will have to come and give their feedback into this and tell you how important this data is to keep. Things like CCTV footage probably doesn't need to be kept for more than three months. But then things like transaction data, you want to keep that for as long as it could go back to. And then scalability. Can we keep adding new data easily? How easy is it to integrate, like, say, new customers or like, from a, if, we, if we purchase a new company to bring in their data? We need to make sure all of our, our, all our internal metrics and um, tools for handling data can scale. And then what about processing time? 
how long do our KPI reports take to generate? Because I once built a KPI report for a company that it was doing tons of processes on telecommunication data. And it took like six hours to complete, which was reasonable because the report would start running, I think, at 2 a.m. every night and finish before 8 a.m. in the morning. However, when they, when, when they wanted to introduce this algorithm to the other branches and the other branches had three to four times, five times more customers, it became infeasible to actually have that run because it would take a good day and their reports would be a day behind. So we had to redesign that algorithm entirely to make it faster. And that's where we use some big data techniques to do that. So let's look at the solutions for this. So big data necessitates some new and advanced databases and data structures. And that's just the first part of it. We also need to have something called a distributed workload. So what exactly is a distributed workload? Well, let's take a look at this, all right? You can see the graphic on the right. You have a computer and then you have tons of computers below it doing work. That's what big data does. If we have these new advanced tools and hardware that can do big data, big data, instead of using one computer, uses multiple computers. So it's called distributed computing, where the, load, the process load and storage load is distributed amongst several different computers. And that allows us to introduce MapReduce. MapReduce was one of the first algorithms that did this. So in the next section, we'll talk about Hadoop, MapReduce, and Spark. These are the big data libraries that you need to know about. So let's so join me in the next section to learn about this. Thank you. All right, so welcome to the third section where we introduce and discuss Hadoop, MapReduce, and Spark as it relates to big data. So let's get going. So let's take a look at the history of big data. So firstly, while computer speed increased linearly over the last few decades, as you can see in this graph, you can see even now, transistor count is going up linearly, but sometimes single thread performance is kind of sort of stagnated. Uh, CPU clock frequencies have sort of stagnated because of the heating issues. So what number of logical cores though is going up though, which is the new way we increase CPU speed by having multiple cores. There's a problem. Data growth did not increase linearly. In fact, it experienced exponential growth just within the last five years, and this is going to continue to grow. So that's why MapReduce was introduced. MapReduce is a programming framework that was introduced by Google in 2004, and it allows programmers to run calculations over thousands of computers in parallel. That's a very, very good um, improvement in distributed computing over how it was previously done. And then it evolved further with advances from Hadoop and Spark and many others. But one of the key paradigms set out by MapReduce was the map reduce phase, which we'll discuss in the next few slides. And it's even still used by Hadoop and Spark today. So let's take a look at the map reduce phase. Now, there's a lot of text here. I'm just gonna explain this out to you for, um, so you understand. So don't read the text just yet, just listen to me. So imagine we have a big data set with a million rows. There's a map function or a map phase that is applied to every row. Like, let's say we're doing an operation. Let's say we're multiplying that row, that, sorry, that column by some X some number. What we do, we produce a map phase where we just have a key value mapping, where the key value mapping is basically just, it just um, in indicates like this is the row, the column we're working with, and then this is the operation we're doing. And then there's a reduce phase where we actually have these um, keys where the operation is applied in the reduce function. But what is good about this is that the key and pair values, remember we're just multiplying in that, that, in that column by a number, that those key and values are then distributed according to different systems, different computers. So once we have that key and value pair, we can just send it off to like 100 or 200 computers. And then in the reduce phase, gather all the, the key and values back as the, of the return of the output. So we have a key and the output value return and then merge them all together. That's basically how we parallelize it with MapReduce and it's proven to be super effective. Here's a quick example of how it looks. You can see we have the input data here. We have the mapping phase here. So it just sends it out to different computers. And then when we get the results here, we can reduce it depending on the, the reduce load. It probably is sometimes less or not. I'm not, not really sure but we can just reduce everything here and get back the outputs by just merging all of the, the answers together. So let's talk about Hadoop now. Now Hadoop is a Java-based open source 
system or framework that was developed by Apache a few years after MapReduce and it introduced some very good features. So it introduced something called HDFS, which is a Hadoop distributed file system. So that file system allowed, enabled batch processing engines like MapReduce to basically work a lot more effective and allowed much more control using something called YON, which is the resource management layer. Now Hadoop provided the ability to analyze these large data sets by using the on, and it relied, but it still relied heavily on disk storage as opposed to memory for computation. And therefore, this made Hadoop still a bit slow when we're doing multiple passes of the same data for calculations on that data. So what did we do, all right? However, the advantage of this, I should say, before we go into what did we do to solve this, was that it allowed Hadoop operations to be fairly cheap because hard disk was far cheaper at that time, far hard disk space than RAM, and it still is actually, okay? But this made accessing data quite slow because you know hard disks are very much slower than RAM or even SSDs. So what we did here was that, however, okay, I should just go into the last point. However, Hadoop had very poor support for SQL and that made it a lot negative. So what we did though, we introduced Spark. Well, not we, but they introduced Spark a few years after. And the initial release was in 2014. And Spark honestly changed everything. You can see the comparisons here. Spark was 100 times faster than MapReduce. It was written in Scala, which is a very um, good programming language for distributed computing. Data processing was done in batches in real time, iterative and had interactive graphs and everything, whereas Hadoop was batch process processing. And it was actually far easier to use than Hadoop because over the years they sort of like built, I think it was a functional programming tools they used, um, they built with Spark. So it actually became a lot easier to operate for programmers. And it does in-memory caching, so that means it could enhance system performance quite well, whereas Hadoop did not do that. And then um, Spark introduced a lot of libraries that can work in different programming languages as well, including Python. And it allowed support for machine learning, for streaming data, all sorts of things. So Spark was basically a game changer. And these are the main components of Spark as it stands today. We have Spark SQL, basically for structured data like that, SQL type data, streaming data, we have the machine learning libraries, and then we have graph X for the graph graphical computation. So, well, graph computation, not graphical, okay? And these are the APIs it supports. It supports R, SQL, Python, Scala, and Java. So let's talk about RDDs. This is an important part of Spark. So RDDs stand for Resilient Distributed Dataset. And what they are, basically, they're, they're Spark's way of distributing load across the RAM of the clusters of machines. And it is the primary data abstraction in Spark that's often referred to as the core of Spark. So the features of this was that it was resilient, it was very, very fault tolerant with the help of the line lineage graph as well. And it allowed for recomputation of damaged partitions due to node failures. So if one computer went down, it can actually redo that on another computer if you wanted. It was distributed with data residing on multiple nodes in a cluster. And the data sets were collected in partitions of data with primitive values or values of values, which, which are tuples and other objects. So it was very, very resilient, basically. So now let's get a quick introduction into using Spark by using the PySpark module in Python. So stay tuned for that lesson. Hi, and welcome to our introduction to PySpark. So let's take a look at PySpark. Now, PySpark was a Spark toolkit written in Scala. However, it's built as an API in Python so we can access all of the Spark code true Python, and it's actually been implemented in different languages via wrappers as well, similar wrappers as well. So we have it for R, Java, SQL, and well, of course, Python. And it was made, made possible by Py4j, which allows Python programmers running a Python interpreter to dynamically access Java objects in a JVM. So as such, we can express, you can use PySpark as an API and it allows us to interface with the RDDs in Python, which is quite cool. And this allows Python programmers to work with RDDs within Python. So this is, this is a look of the PySpark overview. So we have a PySpark and Python right here. Well, with, it's a, this is our Jupyter notebook, firstly. Let's start there. And then it's running PySpark and Python. And then what we do, we access PySpark, well, true PySpark. We access 
the Apache Scala code here that runs within a JVM Java, Java virtual machine. So this is quite cool. So this is how, going all the way back, we access these PySpark functions within Python seamlessly. So let's take a look at how popular PySpark is in industry. You can see companies like Netflix, eBay, Alibaba, and many, many others are using PySpark. In fact, the healthcare industry is beginning to use PySpark to form genome sequencing and it's proven to be very effective. Um, financial sector has made significant use of PySpark in terms of building their trading platforms, because remember, they have tons of data coming in as well. And retail, e-commerce, and any type of site that has just a lot of like transactional data, like big credit card companies, they of course too would be using PySpark. So let's take a look at some of the deeper parts of PySpark, namely the RDDs, transmissions, actions, and lineage graphs and jobs, because this is how we build Spark, uh, I guess you can say Spark processes and Spark actions within Python. So stay tuned for that chapter. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to our section on RDDs, transmissions, actions, lineage graphs, and jobs. All of this is done within PySpark, and you'll learn about them right now. Whoops. So firstly, let's talk about RDDs, which are stand for Resilient Distributed Data in Python. So when we load data in, in PySpark, it creates an RDD object. An RDD object is immutable, which means that we can't actually alter it once it's been lo loaded. And RDDs do not have a schema. This means they do not have um, a column-like structure. Records are just recorded row by row and are displayed in, in similar to a list. So RDDs are analogous, but very different to pandas data frames. They're very similar, but they're a little bit different, which you'll see shortly when we go inside Python and start implementing and using the RDD objects. And RDD objects, once loaded, once the data is loaded, we can run them in any of the, once you load the object, there are many different accessible methods that we can use on that object. So, RDD's implementation allows us to evaluate code lazy. What exactly is lazy evaluation? Lazy means it postpones running a calculation until it's needed. So a regular compiler like Python, Python goes through line by line every expression it comes across. However, a lazy compiler doesn't do that. What it does, it, continue, it doesn't continue evaluate expressions. What it actually does is that it, um, it, it sort of groups everything together but doesn't actually perform anything until it actually is asked to. So it, it just stores these instructions or expressions in like a chain or a pipeline, and only it's only done, it's only executed when it's needed. So let's take a look at the type of some main methods in Spark. We have some transformation methods here. We have map and reduce by key. And we also have some actions, take, reduce, save as text file collect. There are many more, but these are the main ones we'll be discussing. So what exactly are transformations? Well, transformations are one of the most important methods that you can perform on RDs in Spark. They are lazy operations again, and it creates one or more RDD objects because RDDs are immutable. They can be altered once they've been, been created. So transformations take an RDD as an input and apply some function on them and outputs one or more RDDs, as I said before. So in lazy computation, as a scalar compiler, basically as a scalar, scalar compiler comes across each transformation, like I said before, it doesn't actually build any new RDDs yet, but it constructs a chain or pipeline of hypothetical RDDs that would result from those transformations, which will only be evaluated once that action is called. So that's important because that's basically the concept of the chain or pipeline that allow Spark to work. So the chain or hypothetical or child RDDs are all connected logically back to the original parent RDD, and this is called the lineage graph. So let's talk about actions. Actions are any operations on, on RDDs that do not produce an RDD output. An example of them, because an RDD output basically is the data frame or the data set altered. So an example of this would be getting things like count, max, minimum, these type of aggregation operations. So let's take a look at now lineage, lineage graphs. So remember I said the graph basically is constructed lazily, um, just basically stores all the hypothetical chains that can arise from that execution. Well, those are transformation, those are called transformation operations, all right? And they're only evaluated once an action is called. So they all go back, this, a chain is basically called like a child. 
like this is the start of our chain here and these are the child operations that could be done and this basic this structure here is called a lineage graph all right so a lineage graph outlines a logical execution plan the compiler begins with the earliest rdd that are dependent on any of the other rdds as well and the transformation basically ends until it reaches the last logical um, transformation at the end of that RD, rdd chain so lineage graphs are the drivers of Spark's fault tolerance because if a node fails, the information of what that node was supposed to do is held in a lineage graph, and then it can just be transferred that workload to somewhere else. So let's take a look at Spark applications and jobs. In Spark, whenever processing needs to be done, there is something called a driver process, and that is in charge of taking the user's code, converting it into a set of multi and converting it into a set of multiple tasks. There are also something called executor processes each operating on separate node or cluster. So these executed processes are in charge of running tasks that are delegated by the driver, all right? So imagine this is a diagram right here. You have the, basically the processes that need to be done, the driver, and then the driver basically sends these off to the worker nodes, which have the executor, which stores the list of the processes that needs to be done or the tasks. So each driver has a set of ex executors there's a, that, that, that's these things here. And the worker node is basically node, computer nodes here. And then we have something called a cluster manager, which I'll explain right after, but let's just finish this explanation here. So each driver has a process of set of, has a, each driver process has a set of executors that can run our tasks. Now a Spark application is a user-built pro program that consists of a driver and that driver's associated executors. So that's how our program structures itself in the background. So a Spark job is just, is just simply a set of tasks that need to be executed by our drivers. And the cluster manager here is what, multi what manages the basically distributed system of nodes that we have working, or the worker nodes, all right? So this is an example of a Spark overview. So we have the RDD here. We create our RDD as well. All transformations will produce a new RDD as well. So we have the lineage here. For the, um, remember the lineage graph that you saw right here? That's where we have all the hypothetical RDDs that could be created from a, from a result of these transformations. Because remember, you in, remember in Pandas, you have sometimes a lot of chain transformations that you can be done. That's what these are here. And this lineage stores the order of them, the order they need to be done. And then actions, remember actions don't create an RDD, just create like a, a, a variable type output, like a single variable type output, like count, max, min, those sort of op operations. So this is a good, overview of how Spark operates. So now let's go into Python and start doing some simple data cleaning using PySpark. Thank you and join me in the next section. Bye. Subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update.